new friends and newcomers to the South Orange Library Lecture Series. For anyone who asks how I get my speakers throughout the years, here is one way I get them. We have a very fascinating speaker, Colleen Odom, who I have been, pri who I have been privileged to know for many years. And one time when she was speaking to me about her background, I thought it was so fascinating. I said, you must speak at the group, for the group. And of course she said right away, no, I don't think so. <laughs> this is the truth. And I don't know, I told her, of course, that she'll never take out another book at the library. I don't, know what I, I don't know what I said to convince her, but I was so happy when she said that she would do it. And, and Pauline is a very busy lady. Most of the time she can't even come to my programs because she's swimming. Walking in the water. And walking in the water. I call it swimming. <laughs> but in, in any case, I have asked her many times, Oh, you must come to my program. She goes, I can't, I'm busy. This is a very busy lady, and she reads a lot. She's very bright, she's very sweet, she's very wonderful. And I just wanted to tell you, not only is she a wonderful lady, and Pauline is special in, money, in many ways, but in one of the ways, she is very successful as a mom, and as a grandma, and as a great-grandma. Pauline's daughter, Myla J.C., assemblywoman, has been why don't you say about Myla? Yeah. In the fields of education, women's rights, health care, and affordable housing, and many other things. I believe you learn kindness and goodness from your family background. And that is why I thank you, Myla, but I especially thank you, Pauline, for all that you have done for everyone who knows you and in everyone's life. Before I begin, I thank all of the people who have helped me with these programs. I couldn't do it without them. And Brent, you're wonderful in filming this. <laughs> thank you. And, and Metty in setting up. It really is a group project. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our very special guest and my very special friend, Pauline Odin. read the notice that I was going to speak, and my topic was growing up knowing my place. Maybe you wondered what that meant. Well, I grew up in Tennessee in the South, and at that time, my parents were always conscious of giving us advice as to what we could do and not do. And being of the colored race at that time, they didn't call us black, they didn't call us Negro, they called us colored. You always had to know that you could not do certain things. You could not sit next to a white person who was on the bus. We could not eat in the restaurants unless we stood up. And we could only go, I was talking to my classmate, to the zoo. It was either one day a year or either one day a week. And if there was a carnival or something in town, we had one day in which to go. In other words, I was looking up the word separate, and also the other word was segregate. Segregate had to do more with a political uh, era but separate men's to separate the races so that we would not come in contact with other whites. Now, I was born on a farm in Cardova, Tennessee, and my father had finished medical school in, in 1904. He was practicing medicine in Memphis, but decided to buy a farm. And the reason in the South, if you own land, you could vote. And that seemed to be very important to him. So rather than get the people to take care of the farm as he had hoped, we had to move out to the farm, which meant it had quite an, an, um, in other words, the schooling became a problem. 
by that the schools only went up to eighth grade. In order for us to have an education, there were nine of us. He decided, I guess with my mother, agreed also, that we would live in Memphis nine months out of the year to go to school and they go home in the summer. Which meant my mother had to be in Memphis with us for the school year and my father on the farm. And not realizing what the sacrifice they must have made at that time in order for all of us to go to school. So we did go, we all finished college, and what happened was that the TVA came into play. I don't know if anybody is aware of the Tennessee That's Valley the Authority. Yes. <clears throat> well, at the time that they were looking for air places in which to build a plant, my father's farm was what they wanted. He did not want to sell, and this was 1960. One. He knew the value of the land because our farm was 278 acres. It was quite a big farm. And we had lived among all the white farmers in Cardover and always had to mind where we were going, who we were going with, or what we were doing. But we, when I look back, it was kind of like a low profile. We didn't want to ripple or make, make ourselves known. So when the TVA decided to select his farm for that plant, it broke his heart because he did not want to sell. The white farms around us, the people really wanted to sell. But he said he knew the value of the land, and he had bought the farm in 1913 and paid $52 an acre, mm -hmm. which was a lot of money. So they declared it eminent domain. And with that, he really didn't have any choice but to. So they took 200 acres, and my father, was supposed to be off in 1963, January. He died that January, that <coughs> December. Just went to, in his sleep. So we don't know whether that had an effect on it, it was just his time. But what has happened since then is that the Shelby County Historical Society, and I think it came about because there were some people who decided to write a book about Little old Cardover, which is now a very uh, prosperous uh, town. And of course, they were looking for the people who had lived in Cardova back in 1920, during the 20s and the 30s, and whatnot. And I guess we were the only family they could find who had a little history and had been involved because my father did practice the medicine and served the community in the area. And he was the first black farmer, black doctor who practiced medicine in Shelby County at that time. So when they looked up the history of what our contribution, or his contribution was to the community, they decided to honor him with one of those road plaques that you, you know, you put on the side. For, for, his, for taking his land and putting the largest TVA station there is, which serves all of Memphis, Tennessee, and the surrounding areas. And someone was writing a book and they said, the people in Memphis should really thank my father for letting them put up the TVA station there because it has reduced their electrical, uh, you know, rates. But growing up in the South, and I was thinking about 
the word segregation. And, you know, we never discussed it. We never talked about it. My classmates or my family, I don't know. We just accepted what was. And this was before civil rights came into being, which changed an awful lot of things. But at that time, you were very conscious of where you would go. You could not sit on the bus next to the white person. You could be arrested or you could be fined. And the theaters, well, there was a beautiful theater in downtown Memphis, but you had to go in the back and sit way up in the top. And I guess the one thing that I think of, how much money has been spent keeping people separate over the years? And how now that the civil rights has enabled people to be together, there aren't many troubles. I mean, there are a lot of problems that I can see. And my other experience that I remember is I was going to college up in Ohio, which meant I had to take the train. And so going up, there was a separate coach for blacks, of course. But once you reach the Mason-Dixon line, you have to change. You could sit anywhere you wanted to, which was fine. But when I would get the train to come back, <laughs> and I'm sitting wherever you wanted to, and then you have to separate, they always wanted to put me in the white coat, and I just, no, I was frightened to death because I didn't want anybody to ask me what high school I went to because I could only name one. And that was, it was just something that made you feel, you, you wish you didn't have to apologize for it, I guess is the right word. And the eating area where they had the little curtain up, and if you went into the dining room on the train, there was a curtain up to, to so that you, the other white passengers couldn't see you. <laughs> so I was thinking of all these dignitaries that we suffered through. For what? For why? Because uh, people who had money to ride the train were certainly going to be dressed and clean and whatnot. So I don't know. And I've been wondering about the whole thing. <laughs> since I've become, I'm 92 years old now, so I've seen a lot. So, now, there must be things you want to ask me, and if you do, I hope I can answer them. Well, first of all, I want to tell you, you are phenomenal. <laughs> <laughs> you did bring a lot of your pictures, which at the end of the program, people could, could look at. Yeah. Okay? I really wanted them to see the picture of my brothers and sisters. You see it there? The last one? Wait, no, no, it, it's on one of those in the folder. This one? Oh. Yes. That, you can pass that around. Okay, we'll pass it around. Uh, I think there's this four is, copies of that. Yeah. Okay. I'll pass around some of them. <laughs> and on the back, you can see the, the, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, that's the <coughs> okay. May I ask? No, no, that's the, uh, the mm -hmm. That's a, the, uh, pass it the, around. May I ask a question, Polly? Um, did your dad practice medicine while he, while he was on the farm, or did he just manage the farm? No, he did both. He did both. That's why they called him the gentleman's farm. Uh -huh. <laughs> And and so, what community did he serve when he was when he was on Cardover the and the surrounding areas, Millington, Brunswick, and um, Mount Pisgah, you know. Uh -huh. And sometimes he'd have to go back into Memphis to, for some of the patients that he had had. Were they all only colored? Huh? What 
Did he service the whole community or just? Yes, not, not the white, except it was an emergency because I know there were times where he did, but that was, if that was, yeah. Thank you. Oh, here's another question. <laughs> no more, no more choice. Oh. Um, at the um, journalist, um, Charlene Hunter I think she uh, she integrated the University of Georgia, and she wrote a book in my place. <laughs> and um, I traveled uh, in the South from the time I was six until I was twelve every summer. And we had to when we got the train in Penn Station, we could sit any place we wanted to. But then when we got to Washington, we had to get off and get in the car behind the uh, engine, where you got a lot of cinders and a lot of right. Soot. And um, one thing that you said that was interesting about the um, the money that was spent, you know, for segregation. Um, I've worked with uh, many teachers who came from the South, and most of them got their masters from Columbia because their states would not allow them to go to the to the college of their state, like the University of Mississippi. Mm -hmm. But the law said that, that since they could not go, then their state would have to pay for them to go any place they wanted to go. Yes, and I was aware of that. If you go any place you want to go, then you're going to go where you think is the best. Mm -hmm. So most of them had their masters from um, Columbia. Right, from the North. In New York. Mm -hmm. and, that, and just think of the money that they had to spend just because they could not go to the college of their state. You know? And uh, one other thing, um, uh, when I was, when I first started going south, I didn't think too much about it, but as I got to my preteen and teen years, I thought more about it. And I asked one of my mother's relatives one time about conditions, and he said to me, "Well, we don't have, we won't have any, we don't have any trouble as long as we stay in our place." That's right. Mm -hmm. Marjorie, in my creative writing, every other Wednesday, Marjorie writes beautiful stories and how she's told us about the tenements. Her, her, Marge, could you just tell about what you said about that your mother refused to go into a tenement? A project. A project, oh, a project. I'm sorry. Yeah, my uh, stepfather came from the service. Uh, Stand up, so uh, He yeah. said that, I'm sorry. you know, since he was a veteran, he was eligible for a um, project, but my mother said, I, I cannot live in a city project. She said, because first of all, there are too many people. And they're all the same kind of people, all poor. And she said, that's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. And she was right. She was right. They took the projects down. Um, you had a question. Oh, yeah. Can you tell us the story of the water fountain and the story of the library, please? <laughs> <laughs> that would make me really happy. <laughs> <laughs> you know how this is, is Mary Thoreau, who she's known probably how many years? <laughs> well, I was with my mother. I, I don't know whether we were outside the bus stop or the train or something, but I was sitting there looking at these two fountains. One said white, one said colored. And I thought, I wonder if the water tastes the same. <laughs> so. Before my mother could say no, I just hopped up and you know tried the water from the white fountain and tried the water from it stayed the same. So I said, why do we need these right beside each other? I mean, if they're going to have them, at least put the white one somewhere. <laughs> but and the library was, I was curious as to when we could use the main library in Memphis. And uh, so I called my classmate last night. Well, he's still alive also. And I said, George, when could we use the main library? And he said, oh, we could go once a week from 2 to 5. I said, really? He said, but I never went because I didn't, I didn't want to, it, it was too far to travel to, for that short length of time. So we were not really uh, part of where you can go to the library. And that's why I'm so crazy about libraries now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I, I just, 
I find myself in them all the time. I don't know whether that's from that, you know. Our president, Donald Trump, he owns apartment houses, you know. In one of them, he has two entrances, one for colored people, one for white. They made him stop. And he only has one colored person in there. It's, that's it, so he's clear. Where is that? Our president. Oh, you mean uh, Trump? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a fact. Yeah. And did you want to say something? I met this man, this gentleman outside, and I told him about your program, and you were just starting to tell me something. Oh, well, basically what I was speaking about was that I'm sure you have knowledge of in uh, Brooklyn, used to be a slave uh, place there, they had plantations in Brooklyn, New York, I'm speaking oh, about. Right. And um, the, work, um, the stock exchange. You know, they have uh, jails under there because the black man used to be the first stock exchange which they was using. And uh, when, if you go there, under the stock exchange, they have prison jail cells because the port, you know, the water's right yeah. and that's where they were doing the transportation, you know, transport. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, you know, just speaking after she was speaking about, you know. Every day. Well, that was the whole problem because a lot of people have the incentive that thinking that only uh, plantations were down south, yeah. Yeah. which is not true when you do your history. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and really do the study about it, and uh, you find out that um, black man was the first for stocks in New York, as far as the stock exchange. Saratoga, New York is famous for that. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. Your yeah. input. There's another question here. Yes. Uh, I'd like to know, okay. uh, in the 60s, were you ever involved in any of the um, civil rights movement with um, boycotting and uh, sit-ins and that type of thing? No, I, I was involved at the very beginning. Uh, my husband and Mala's father and I had uh, come back from Liberia. We'd done four years of missionary work over there. And we went to Florida so he could teach at Florida A&M for a semester and a summer. And they were just beginning to meet in the churches to discuss ideas and how they could go about uh, starting something that would get them the respect that the young men when they came back from the war felt they deserved. And then we moved to Boston and he was in school and died and I never really got back to it because children came and, and I remarried and stuff. But I remember the very beginning because uh, he would go down to the uh, courthouse, Tallahassee was the capital, to find out exactly what the people were talking about there in relation to whether they were aware that there was rumblings and talk of, of uh, changing the laws and whatnot, and come back and report to the people in the church. <laughs> but not actively. I wish I had, but I was aware of it. Here's another question. <laughs> what was the impetus to bring you to this area so that we were fortunate enough to have your daughter as assembly woman in this area. I love that question. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's a long load. Yeah, I was living in Minnesota then, and uh, I had a Down syndrome son, so. The, Myla and her sister and her brother wanted me to come out east to be near them. And I didn't really want to because I knew all the fights and things that they had gotten into because of moose, you know, the Down syndrome. And I did not want to cause her children to have to take up that and also defend him wherever he was or whatever. But we made an agreement that I would come, but if it turned out that he was disruptive and her children couldn't deal with it, then I would not stay. But 
at that time, the schools, well, Kennedy, back in 1959, was instrumental, his family was instrumental in opening up schools and making people more aware of the disadvantage. And it was a good time because people were not looking at the children, you know, like there's something strange. And it was, it was better. And it worked out. So that's why I ended up in <laughs> New Jersey. Tell them what a welcoming community this was for him. Oh, South Orange? Oh, yes. <laughs> Be Sounds repeat. like a politician. <laughs> <laughs> but they were because her son played soccer and Rena played soccer and we couldn't leave him at home. So you had to take him with you. And I wanted to see the kids. And, and they were. Except the one time that he left the house and nobody knew where he was because he was trying to find Kyle's soccer game. And I had gone with Rena, I think, to look at you, your soccer game. So the people, after the police found him, he had been walking all around the, the neighborhood, all around South Arn. After they found him, um, Later on, people said, well, yeah, I saw him, but uh, I just assumed he knew where he was going. <laughs> so <laughs> nobody really called to say. But they were, they were aware of him, and I think if something had happened, they would have let us know. Well, first of all, I think you are so brave and fearless and wonderful. Yes, but, but I just, I would like your daughter and your granddaughter and your great-granddaughter to come up to <laughs> because of, would you mind? I know, I want to go. Would you like to come up? The mother, I mean, you have to tell about your mom because I think she's phenomenal. I really do. And we love her here in the library. So, can I So, she didn't want to come. But I think I think now that she's come, she realizes that people are interested in her stories. And she tells stories all the time. Uh, I hear her on the phone talking to her sister, who's 96, and her two younger brothers who are still living in Memphis. And they spend a lot of time reminiscing, which I think we all do as we get older, right? And, uh, and, I, and I keep thinking, we have to get these stories on tape because she started writing her her stories a while back but that's hard to do and she's not on a computer she refuses she just tells me to do stuff um, but I, I I was sure that people would be interested in her stories and there are many many more one of the things she didn't tell you was that Moose was a grown man he was in his 30s and he was what 250 at least 250 pounds. He's a big guy. And um, we called him the gentle giant. And he was very, very low functioning. But he loved my kids. And my kids loved him. And I have pictures of him holding them. And he never dropped them. He never hurt them. Um, and he loved living here. Uh, because things had definitely changed from when I was a girl. And we literally fought the kids in the neighborhood because they made fun of him because he wore these coke glasses and and he was he was um, different and I had the feeling that coming here to South Orange and Maplewood would be okay because I knew in the schools we were beginning inclusion and we were beginning to keep our children in the community and not send them out and sure enough I mean and he went everywhere he went to the parks, he went to the swimming pool. He couldn't His, leave him at home. Right, you couldn't leave him, and he loved the pool. So tell the story about, a last story, about Rena and the pool. <laughs> well, he loved to splash down at the South Orange pool. And uh, Rena was there, along with all the other young people. And somebody was complaining about him and say, who is that making all that splash and causing? And so Rena pipes up and says, well, that's my Uncle Moose. 
<laughs> but one of the things that I wanted to share is that when we were in Minnesota, we bought some land outside of St. Paul in Minneapolis. And we moved Father O'Neill's old rectory over because there was not a house on the land. And built a uh, basement. So, so one of the things that I wanted to do, even though I didn't realize how prejudiced Minnesota was at that time. So being on the suburban area, being in the suburban area, which is about 10 miles out of St. Paul, they did not want the black our kids in the school. So we had to go through finding a, a what are they call community. Not a community, but a, a school system that would take them. Mm -hmm. And finally, one of them agreed that they would give it a try. Oh. Even though oh we live there, we... Okay. So you have to explain how many kids there were. <laughs> well, I started out with ours. I know, but I mean... They, they don't know how know. many you have. Yeah, you said nine. How many? Oh, no, no, that was her brother. No, no. no. You didn't say how many kids you had. Eleven. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, um, while we were out there living in the suburban area, I felt that we needed to do something for the young black kids in St. Paul. So someone said, well, call the um, adoption, not the adoption. But Social service. Yeah, and I did. And so she said, well, how many did you have? And I told her. She said, well, call me when you're down to three. I said, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I said I'll be out of business when I'm down to three. <laughs> so I was told about a program that a Judge Gingle had that rather than send the young men to detention or put them in a reform school, he wanted to try them in a, what they call a group home. So I called and asked if I could be part of that. And uh, I had eight boys at school, at home at the time, but Myla and her sister, they were all the way in college, so they weren't there. So she said, yes. I said, well, I have eight. She said, that doesn't matter. And so I started with the group home. And you could have as many as you could accommodate. And I think that experience, because these kids were very sophisticated about shoplifting, drugs, and all the kinds, and our boys were not, but I wanted, I don't know, I wanted to do something, because I never got back south to work, that I wanted to work in the rural south, I never got back because I married her father. Who's <laughs> from Montclair? <laughs> and um, for 15 years I did the group home program. So I had eight boys and I would have eight, so there were 16 boys in the house. And so that was another problem with the school system, did but... Uh, did you teach them? I look back on it now and I wonder I know I was taking a chance because my boys could have taken up some of those habits. But I think that having known what these young people, young men went through and what they had, they needed to know the other side of the story. So, uh, and Moose was a great, he loved them because he was a lovable person. And uh, really, the kids warmed to him, and uh, we got out of it. And they took care of him. Yeah, they took care of him. Did you teach so, them there? What What did you do at the group home? Did you teach them there? No, no. I had them in the schools. Oh, in the schools. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they lived there. Oh, they lived 
Make that. Well, if you took, you roll eight and you have eight that uh -huh. to take, take them to school, and you have another eight. They all rode the bus. They all rode the school bus. Sixteen of them. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But it was, you know, it, we were out and we were on 12 acres, so it was, uh, it wasn't that they could run anywhere because some of them did try to run and I would go look, looking for them <laughs> and bringing them back. And then sometimes I'd have to pick them up when they were on a weekend and they got in trouble. But I'm glad I did it. And I think my boys appreciated the fact that they had experience with other kids who were less fortunate, fortunate than they were. Mm -hmm. And I also learned that if you don't have responsible parents, you are so many strikes against you at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it's so sad that, that, that people have the children and don't realize what they are and how precious they are. And as my father always said, we didn't owe him anything. He owed us. Mm -hmm. He always said that because he brought us into the world. So it was his responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I felt that way about mine. They don't owe me anything. Just to be the best person they can be. This is not about your, your children, but do you know anything about your grandfather and great-grandfathers, who they were, what they did? Yeah, <laughs> well, we never asked my father how they got money to go to Meharry, because they grew up on a farm in Mississippi. But my niece had done some ancestry research, and what she learned was that my grandmother, Fanny, was a product of a white plantation owner in Georgia. And when he moved to Mississippi with his brother, he took her mother and Fanny with him. And the brother of the white plantation owner, which was Fanny's father, was a doctor, Dr. Gresham in Mississippi. And uh, we feel that he was the one responsible for seeing that they went to med school. There was two brothers. His brother went too. So. No, it's okay. You are brave and fearless. I can't get over it. I just want. There's no question, but I just wanted to make another statement that uh, Central Park, which everyone know about, right? Yes. So that used to be known as Synagogue Village, and they. Um, <laughs> Did the same thing. Black men have they have bought that particular land and at a certain period of time, like the same thing that happened to your father when he uh, mm -hmm. called the domain uh, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and that's how Central Park became. But if you go there now, you still will find the it's called the Abbas. The Abbas is yes. 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 still in uh, yes. Central yes. Park. Yes. 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 Thank you. 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 But I learned so much today. I remember learning about you jumped over the broom, and I, I read so many books. But thank you so much. Yeah, those much. were traditions that. Oh, um, I just I don't know. I just love American history and the South. So thank you. That's one thing that I've wondered about. Uh, the people who come from the islands, from Jamaica and, and Trinidad, and Trinidad and places were allowed to go to school to learn and it was always a puzzle to me when I uh, realized that I said you were able to go to school you were and they said yes mm -hmm. and then I began to 
talked to her husband. I said, why do you think that was? And he said, well, the British and the French and the Dutch established their sugar plantations and had to have people to carry them on after they left because they did not plan to stay. Mm. Where in America, mm. the white man planned to stay, so therefore he had to find a way in which to keep out separate. Yeah. I happen to be privy to a little more knowledge about Polly. And I want all of you, I'm going to urge you to mark May 13th, a Saturday, to come to SOPAC, where Polly is going to be, well, photographed and talked Yeah, but there are, others, there are others too, right? Oh, yeah. Yes, there are. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. But, you may be queen of that. <laughs> uh, it's going to be at SOPAC from 1 until 3. There are, I'm not sure. I think there are seven people being documented uh, in combination with Seton Hall students. It was excellent last year. Really good, Nan. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did.